In a recent live stream, the subject turned to flux on circuit boards and whether you should try and clean the flux off after you've soldered. And I've never really done that. And it inspired me to dig out some old circuit boards, including the circuit boards for this game, which dates back to 1995. Hold on, let me just grab a circuit board here. Um, This is the prototype. 1995. So it's now 2023. That's quite some time, isn't it? That's about 28 years that this uh, circuit board was made. And looking at the back of it, there's no sign of any corrosion. Normally, when copper corrodes, you'd expect to see a sort of green crustiness from the oxidation. Um, If the other, well, if the lead had corroded, you'd expect to see a white residue. But there's nothing uh, on either of these circuit boards. So that kind of makes me think, you know, I don't think it's really an issue with the hard flux. The wet plumbing type flux, you wouldn't really want to do that. You'd want to clean it off. But in the case of the hard rosin flux, it's not such an issue. So this was a game uh, for a fairground. And it was basically a Wheel of Fortune type game. And it was quite interesting because... uh, It's based on a microcontroller. This is the emergency backup module. This isn't the main unit that was used in the commercial versions. The main unit used in the commercial versions was much bigger, and it had big, huge, illuminated fruit machine-style buttons, slot machine-style buttons. And uh, it also had speech, so that as well as playing sound effects, it would just randomly slip in things like, it's the number one game sensation, Casino Royale. Um, just, you know, random things uh, in amongst the the advertising sequence. Uh, Done with information storage devices, chips. Uh, Really strange chips. They were, you controlled them uh, from the microcontroller and triggered to trigger them, and then they played back in what was basically analog memory. So you could record into them, and then they'd play that back with sort of pretty much CD quality. Not bad. Um, To control the displays... The microcontroller in this one, it's a PIC-16F... No, it's a PIC-16C54. How old is that? Uh, But that uh, controlled the displays by using zero data. And uh, it's a synchronous network it uses. It's got clock and data. And uh, this is a, a mimic display. The main displays had tungsten lamps on them. And to control that number of lamps, uh, there'd be four lamps in series, six volt lamps across 240. To control that number of lamps, it used triacs. And uh, this small transformer wouldn't normally be enough to drive the triac because they, they take quite a lot of current. And I, I used various cheating techniques to actually allow um, it to run, use a small transform to drive quite high current to these tracks. And the way I did it was with this circuitry here, you can see the resistors here going to an AC optwise later. And that, uh, this is a standard uh, serial to parallel LED display driver. And it's got a resistor that sets the current and the output, which was set for the triac triggering. And uh, there's a optwise later, I'm trying to remember how it did it. The opto isolators in series with that, I think, is it? And it uh, basically gated the output current so that as the mains passed the zero crossing point, it just pulsed the output current to the tracks. So this small transformer could do that because uh, just basically 100 times a second would just provide that trigger pulse at the start of the sine wave. I can actually see looking at the prototype here. Here's the prototype which has uh, resistors to emulate the tracks and it has the floating leads for the uh, test resistors and also the wee note in it with a capacitor to cause a slight phase shift. Um, I probably scoped this with an isolated uh, scope to uh, work out the point it was triggering in the sine wave and it just by adding the capacitor it would cause a slight phase shift which would result in the uh, a longer pulse at the start of the sine wave instead of at the end of it. Um, So that was more or less it. In hindsight, these days, knowing what I know now, I'd use a RS-485 driver for this. It's an opto-isolated input, dual opto-isolated isolator, with a couple of LEDs to show the actual data is present. But uh, the RS-485 is better at driving networks. Uh, This was a very simple circuitry using this. But it worked, and that's the main thing. Uh, Anything else worth saying about these?
Not really. No, it worked. It was a successful enough game. The only awkward bit was uh, me recording all the voice samples. It just felt a bit odd. This uh, censored slightly. Uh, this is a tin plated circuit board where I've basically dipped it in the tinning solution um, after etching it. And this, this again shows no signs of the corrosion. So I'll give you a demonstration of this, but I'll warn you in advance that it's about to get very, very loud because I've, I've jerry-rigged up a audio interface. Because that's a microphone level output, I've used a potentiometer and a spare radio microphone uh, to couple that onto the receiver, uh, which means that uh, you'll be able to hear the game playing at full noise. If you see it pauses there during the sequence, that's because it's playing a sound effect or triggering the sound sample, the speech sample, um, which is in the, the main unit. The, there are three buttons to operate. There's the reset button, there's the uh, which just basically resets the whole game from scratch. Start, which puts it into the, um, the initial pre-play mode, and then that lights in the main unit, that lights a big, huge, round, illuminated button that could be passed out to one of the players uh, so they could press it to start the game just to show that it was completely random and it was completely random although there was a cheat mode if needed to make sure that uh, it biased in the operator's favour in hindsight if I was rewriting the software if I was doing it again I would uh, integrate other features I would actually if maybe it was quiet there weren't enough players to actually play the full game then I would in incorporate a feature that one person would play and basically speaking, it would do that sort of like the standard uh, family entertainment centre type game where it rotates and you have to try and stop it on the one that's uh, the sort of centre one or something like that. And again, if uh, just to avoid um, paying out too many prizes, I'd do exactly what they do in the family entertainment centres of sort of arcades these days and I'd basically just buy either side so it only paid out in percentage. But you know, there's a one. Everything's in software, so it's completely versatile. But anyway, I shall give you a demonstration of this now, warning you in advance. It's about to get very loud because it's got lots of uh, square wave sound effects generated in assembly code uh, in the processor. So it's going to sound a bit um, arcadish right now. Let's play a game. Headphone alert. Things are about to get loud. When the operator wants to start the game, they press start. It initially skitters about randomly, and then either the operator can start the spin or a member of the public can hit a big red button to start the spin, and then it does this. During the main spin, it reduces the volume, and then steps back up again. Then it goes back into the advertising sequence and the game can start again. And there we have it. So that's kind of answered the question about the flux corroding. It's certainly, uh, there may be some fluxes that do it. Let me know what you, your experiences are in the description down below because I've just never really had an issue with flux corrosion of stuff except in the early days of the lead-free era when they were using really aggressive fluxes to try and get the solder to stick to stuff, I've noticed that uh, on some situations, the flux that they've used, maybe uh, they've maybe used a paste flux, and I would recommend washing paste flux off afterwards. But um, in some of those instances, I've seen significant corrosion. Um, what else can I really say here? Um, I would recommend in surface mount washing off the residual paste flux but you also have to consider that if I was cleaning the flux off this then it could potentially get into things like the sockets and stuff like that because if you're using isopropanol it would dissolve the rosin and then it would start creeping into places and that could cause more problems particularly things like potentiometers but that is it uh, a little showcase of uh, 
Fairground Games as well as a, a discussion about the flux.